Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I am your host, Sean Needham, along with my wonderful wife, Janet, and we are streaming live from the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Studio. And first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to our podcast. Our podcast is an ever-growing um, ever growing, ever educating, uh, you know, and we, uh, our goal of the podcast uh, is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. And I'm just super excited of this journey that we've been on for almost what now, Janet, two, almost two years, no, over two years, uh, two and a half years, three yep. years. Yep. Yeah. Two and a half. Yeah. I think it'll be three years in October when we started the podcast and it was just perfect timing um, right before 2020 when there was a shutdown in our economy, and we'll get the later. We'll get into that later when I discuss my book today. Um, but it was just perfect timing because it allowed us to start reaching out to people through um, video and through social media. And I will tell you, it's it's been a great honor and privilege. And we just want to thank everybody for listening and viewing in. And as always, if you can comment and share this show and subscribe to our podcast we stream live on youtube the moses lake professional pharmacy youtube page we stream live on my personal page and the moses lake professional pharmacy facebook page um, but we are also on many other um, social media platforms so you can find me on TikTok. you can find me on instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, and we're uh, and Rumble. Don't forget about Rumble. There are some times where we get censored on YouTube, and so we put our videos on Rumble. And we have over 900 educational videos now on our YouTube channel. And those videos range from we talk about diet, we talk about exercise, we talk about sleep, and we talk about hormone replacement and everything in between, including the politics of healthcare and. You know, that is important because when you look at how healthcare is delivered now, there's a lot of politics involved. I think the last two years has really um, shown how the politics can come out in healthcare. So that's one of the reasons I did write a book, and my book is called Sickened How the Government Ruined Healthcare and How to Fix It. And I had a wonderful time over. This last weekend, um, I had a book signing event, and it was my first ever book signing event. And I had events planned before, but because of COVID, those events got shut down. So I'm looking forward to signing more books. And it was basically an opportunity to get a personal signed copy of my book at this event. And it was just a tremendous support. There was a tremendous turnout. And I appreciate everybody for turning out and buying my book. My book is available on Amazon, Sickened, How the Government Ruined Healthcare and How to Fix It. It's available in paperback. It's also available in Kindle version. And soon it will be available in audio version. I will tell you, we released it in Kindle in 2019. And that was, well, it wasn't easy, but um, it was uh, a lot easier than paperback, and it was much easier than audio. Getting the audio book to, um, not print, but to press, has been one of the most difficult. I've been working on the audio book for over, well over a year now, and the details to get the audio portion worked out. It's personally recorded in my voice. Um the details with the audio is is more complicated than, than writing the book, so than a written book. So um, stay tuned for that. And um, Janet, you have some questions for me. I do. Um, just one more comment, though, about the event this weekend. Um, we had it locally in East Wenatchee and such a nice opportunity to um, – talk to people and share uh, Sean's book with them. And it was just a beautiful event and pretty exciting. You know, we've been waiting to do this for quite some time. So um, Sean's really excited about it. And so am I. Um, but let's just jump in and we uh, probably should ask, why did you write a book? Because um, most people don't write books. So what, yeah. was, what was the inspiration? No, that's Sean? a great question. So, you know, I've been a pharmacist now for over... 25 years. And I started writing the book in about 2015. But for years before that, um, I, you know, I was over and over again, talking to patients and talking to people about our healthcare system. And um, 
finally I decided, and it was just the same words over and over again. I'm like, you know, I should write a book about this. And so I did. And that was in 2015. And part of the reason I wrote the book too, is because I had a health journey myself. Um, you know, I was obese, you know, 12 years ago or so. And, you know, when I changed my lifestyle, I figured too that I could help others change their lifestyle and take charge of their own health. So my journey of my health is in the book also, but it also gets into the details of, you know, how the government ruined healthcare and how to fix it. And just a little tip, the government is not the fix. Janet? Right. So um, since we are in 2022, where healthcare is a little bit in shambles, um, this is perfect opportunity to start uh, as a consumer, as a client, as a patient, start looking at, um, you know, what is wrong with the system. So let's address this. Well, so one of the biggest thing that's wrong with the system is we have a sick care system. We don't, you know, we call it health care, but it's it's not health care. Um, when's the last time, you know, a hospital or a big clinic um, talked about your health? They, they talk about sick stuff. So you have high blood pressure, they prescribe a drug. You have um, high cholesterol, they, they prescribe a drug. They don't talk to you about changing your habits, changing your diabetes is a perfect one. Type 2 diabetes probably, I don't know the stats exactly, but you know, 95%, 99% of all type 2 diabetics do not need to be on medication. They can get off medication by by changing their lifestyle. And even type 1 diabetics for that matter, I, I get I get a lot of haters for this one, but even type 1 diabetics for that matter, they don't need a lot of the insulin they they are told they need if they just eat appropriately. So we have a whole episode on that on on, on our podcast. Episode 1 actually um, with my twin brother, um, his son is a my nephew is a type 1 diabetic and he talks about how to treat type 1 diabetes affordably and diet is so important diet and exercise are so important so so that's the the thing is that we we live in a sick care system our our system profits off sick people do you think our system wants people to to um, be off their high blood pressure medication no do you think they want them to be off their diabetes medication no do you think they want them to have complications of diabetes? Yes, they do. I know that sounds so horrible, but they do because that's how the system profits. Let's even take orthopedic surgery. On our podcast about two years ago, we had Dr. Sean Baker on our podcast, and he's an orthopedic surgeon. I recommend you look him up. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's actually moved to Washington State now. Poor guy. Um and he, 10 plus years ago, used to recommend to his patients that were going to have knee surgery, shoulder surgery, hip surgery. He would recommend the keto diet for them. And all of a sudden, the patients would lose weight and they wouldn't be as inflamed. They wouldn't be in pain anymore. They wouldn't need surgery. So, and he said on our podcast, 70% of all orthopedic surgeries, this is from an orthopedic surgeon, could be prevented if people change their lifestyle. Do you think? hospitals, clinics, and doctors, most doctors want to stop that. No, they don't. Well, let's let's back up. In the current system right. that we have in the sick care model, but if we were in a preventative and well, wellness model, we could make it an incentive in, in the appropriate way. Right. Well, one of the incentives is, is that you have a better quality of life. Correct. But one of the problems with our healthcare system also is that, you know, a lot of people don't pay anything for it. So when somebody doesn't pay anything for it, there's no value. So if you are a type 2 diabetes, diabetic or you have all kinds of lifestyle related, related problems, whether it be, you know, COPD because you're a smoker and you're on medications that are thousands of dollars a month, if they're not costing you anything, do you think you have any incentive to get off those medications? No, not really. Um, there would be more incentive if you had to pay out of pocket for it. But when a third party is paying the bill, and this is all in my book, patients have to have skin in the game. When a third party is paying the bill, there's more of an inclination that a patient is not only going to be not going to want to get off the medication or want to get healthy, but they're also not going to be as compliant because they're not paying for their medication. Well, I, I, I kind of... I kind of think from a consumer standpoint and a patient standpoint, though, we aren't giving people credit that 
if they were given better options and options were easier to access, I think it would be um, a better system and it also would be a better outcome because I I have clients that talk to me and, and their doctors or their healthcare professionals aren't even taking time to even explain to them that the simple things that they need to do that their provider should know they're capable of doing. That, that conversation isn't even happening. And I feel they're cheated because, you know, you're paying for something that is uh, a Band-Aid. It's not taking away the problem. It's not dealing with the actual reason for that problem. So consumers do have choices uh, more so today than they even when we first went into pharmacy. But, you know, I, I feel like it's it's not really fair to say to the consumer or the patient that, you know, you're not going to do a lifestyle change um, because you're just, you're just not capable of doing it and we don't think you can, or for whatever reason, I don't have the time to explain it to you because I'm busy as a profession billing insurance rather than actually addressing the issue. Well, I, that's a good point, Janet. And, and that's, I will tell you this, if I, I think it's a cop out for any healthcare professional to say that a patient's not going to be compliant with lifestyle changes, that's just a cop out because the healthcare professional doesn't want to take the time to educate the patient. And part of the reason they don't have time, and it is it is self-inflicted, it is their choice. Part of the reason they don't have time is because they're too stuck, you know, checking boxes for insurance companies on how to get reimbursed. And that's another thing I talk about in my book is that healthcare professionals need to get out of that system. They need to be they're, the cons they need to work directly with the consumer, directly with the patient, and no third party in between, no insurance company in between, and they will get better care, more quality care um, at, a, at a lower price. So, I mean, that, and I go into that in, in my book. I know that's hard for some people to understand, but it's just totally true. Well, I will say this, working alongside Sean in our pharmacy, our trajectory changed when we uh, stopped billing insurance and actually started a cash-only pharmacy. And the stories of clients and their families of them taking care of their health and improving their outcomes, they really do happen. And it's part of every day of, of what we do at our own pharmacy. And we know that trend is happening across the nation. So it's possible. I think one of the things that we forget is insurance was not always a part of our system. When did that start? What what triggered this movement of yeah. depending on insurance or the government? Right. Well, I mean, that's an interesting story. And thank you for asking that. And of course, it's it's in my book, Sickened, How the Government Ruined Healthcare and How to Fix It. Um, I go back and how the health insurance thing actually started. And of course, as you can imagine, um, just like the title in my book, the government caused it to happen. Consumers didn't demand it. Um, consumers were not unhappy with the way healthcare was. But here's what happened. So typical government regulation and unintended consequences. Back in the 1940s, we're deep in World War II. FDR is president. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is president. And he is worried about out-of-control inflation. Okay, does that sound familiar with what's going on right now? Yeah, let's hope the government doesn't do anything. Well, the government caused the inflation anyway, but um, I digress. So he didn't want to. He didn't want wages to get out of control. So what did the government do? They put in price control or wage control. So the government decided how much money could be compensated per job. So, for instance, General Motors and Ford. They were in the middle of building tanks and airplanes and cars for the war effort. So they were busier than busy and they needed employees. Um, but the government set a a wage limit on, you know, a certain type of employee. So if Ford wanted to go to General Motors and say, hey, um, you know, employee Joe Blow, I want you to come to work for us. I can't pay you anymore. But what I can do is I can give you what's called hospital insurance. And then if you have a baby or your kid is sick or you're sick, it's covered. You don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, a, a big hospital bill. So that's where it really started. And they did that so they could entice an employee to come to work for us. So they gave hospital insurance. Well, fast forward, you know, 70 years later, and now people just think, 
part of him being employed is they're entitled to some kind of health insurance. Now, what are the consequences of that? Well, when they first came out with hospital insurance, it was just that. You know, you got in a car wreck or, you know, you got in a big accident, you got cancer or or you had a baby that was covered. Um, but what do we do? You know, as it got further in, especially in Medicare, and I talk about this in the 1960s is when Medicare came in. And then all of a sudden we started having, you know, more routine stuff covered, um, like doctor's visits, you know, are covered. And at the time, I, I you know, I, the doctor that delivered me, um, Dr. Richard Bunch, um, he just passed away just a few years ago. And I, I, he practiced before Medicare. And if you ask him how much a, office visit was before Medicare in the early 60s. Medicare came out in 64. Um, an, uh, an office visit was $2. A home visit was $3. And, you know, when you look at the average office visit now is like $300, um, that doesn't keep up with inflation. That's because healthcare has went crazy price-wise because the government started paying for it. So, but they started paying for th routine things like doctor's visits and 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 that's what we have now. Um, you know, and I have a great video out. It's called, What If Auto Insurance Worked Like Health Insurance? And basically, you know, auto insurance, it covers our wrecked car, correct? And that's nice, right? We wreck our car, we get our car covered. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about a major expense of a new car. But what if our auto insurance paid for our gas in our car? That's mm. <laughs> right. Right now, that would be pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But essentially, essentially paying for the everyday items. What if our auto insurance paid for windshield wipers? What if they paid for tires? What if they paid for all those routine items, brake changes? That's what we've got in our healthcare system. And I'll tell you what would happen and go, go to our YouTube channel, the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy YouTube channel and type in auto insurance. You type in that in, in there and that video will come up. It's about a three and a half minute video. And there's some sarcasm in there, but there's a lot of truth in there. And what would happen? Well, all of a sudden, instead of tires being $1,000, tires, tires would be $10,000. But oh, let's not worry because they're covered, but you only do a two, you, you pay $2,000 copay. The tires are $10,000, you get covered eight and you pay a $2,000 copay, you'd still be better off paying cash for the tires. That's the whole purpose. So when we have somebody else paying for the bill, prices escalate, services go down, and quality goes down, period. When the consumer is not in charge of the payment, that's exactly what happens. Well, and even in our state of Washington, where we live, um, we're required to pay for maternity leave and, or maternity um Health Harvard, insurance, health yeah. Health insurance. So in in what I'm trying to point out is, is there is coverage that we are paying for that we may not need or, or want or, or want. And we have no say into how to put it together as to what works better for that particular individual because it's one size fits all. It's a cookie cutter type situation. And we can't go across the state line. So there's no competition. It's all just one type of you know group that gets allowed in so it's really restricting to those services and i'm sure that there are providers that know what's covered or clinics and hospitals and and so then you bill for things that are covered and the things that aren't covered either are ignored or not addressed or if they are then you know it's out of pocket and it can be an outrageous um fee yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I talk about it in my book. Um, a few years after Medicare was enacted back in the 1960s, nursing home utilization went up 700%. And that's just a perfect example of how all of a sudden people didn't need to go to a nursing home. But now all of a sudden, if it was free and Medicare was paying for it, which there's no such thing as free, um, but all of a sudden as Medicare is paying for it, we need all these people in a nursing home. And it was basically, a, you know, a way for you know, some people to profit off Medicare. And that still happens today. There are very, I, re, I talk about it in my book, um, you know, uh, upwards of 80% of procedures are probably unnecessary and just, just done because an insurance company covers it. And I, I see it all the time when I have friends or family members that, you know, they'll need some kind of, you know, knee arthroscopy or something like that. It's like, well, what what's the knee arthroscopy going to do if you're not going to have surgery? Well, I have knee pain. Okay. You know, but they find out that, it's, you know, what kind of insurance you have, they're going to cover it. Sure, we'll do it. 
Well, I, I also think what happens is the insurance dictates to that healthcare professional is the steps that they need to take before they actually do the procedure that the patient needs. You see that many times that, you know, you have to do this step before you can do this step. And then, you know, that provider knew right away what his client or patient needed. So that has been delayed as time goes on. So perhaps the, the outcome could have been faster and quicker and more uh, beneficial to the client versus doing all these other procedures before we get to the one that they really needed. And, you know, I can speak to that in the case of my mother where, you know, she needed a, she needed a pacemaker, but we'd had to do all these other procedures before we could get to that. So she was, you know, it's not just her time. It, it, it's the mental part. It's dealing with the family to get her there. And then you're billing for procedures that didn't correct the problem. And the cardiologist knew what the problem was from the start. So we're taking the actual practice of medicine out of the hands of the provider and the professional that knows what needs to be done and adding additional costs onto the client, the clinic. You know, I mean, we could be talking about this all day, but, you know, I guess taking the direction from the healthcare professional away is really what's happening here. Yeah. Insurance companies have basically, you know, controlled healthcare and it, it doesn't have to be that way. Consumers should be in charge of their own health and they should work with a healthcare professional that has them in mind, not a health, not a health insurance company. And if that healthcare professional is being reimbursed by a health insurance company, guess who the customer is? The customer is not the patient because they're not paying the bill. The customer is a health insurance company. And that's why service is so bad in most places that take health insurance because the patient is not the individual customer. They're not getting reimbursed by them. So I will tell you, we work with a lot of cash clinics, direct primary care clinics, and just clinics that don't take cash, even specialty, or that don't take insurance, even specialty clinics. And guess what? Their service is much better. Why? Because that individual patient is paying the bill. If they lose that patient, they lose money. Um, whereas in, in a ho big hospital type system where they're being reimbursed by Medicare, Medicaid, government programs, they don't really care about the individual patient because that's not who pays the bill. But all of a sudden, if Medicare or Medicaid tells them to dot an I or cross a T or they're going to lose their funding, oh, you bet you, they'll jump. But when it's to an individual patient, not even maybe. So not only in a cash situation where the individual patient is paying the bill, do they get better service? Um, but it's a lower price too. You don't have to have all those people that are hired to build that insurance and deal with the re rejections and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just a, it's a transactional thing between the patient provider, like any other commodity, like any other industry um, is. That's why healthcare is such an interesting animal because it's um, like no other industry when you put a third party in it like that. So we're really excited that we have new projects that are being planned out in the future, Sean. So why don't we kind of talk a little bit about what that looks like? Um, what What is the future project with your well, book? And yeah, thanks for that question. I, you know, I had some book signing events um, scheduled for you know the last couple of years, but you know, COVID kind of shut everything down. Not kind of it did. I should say the government shut everybody down. COVID didn't. The government did. Um, and so I had to put those off, but that's why I was so excited about my event, um, Sunday yesterday, because it was just, you know, the first one I had an opportunity to, to, to get in front of people and get in front of people who were interested in my book and, um, you know, chat to like my like-minded people and personally autograph a copy for them. So the future is I want to do that again. Um, you know, I travel all over the country for business. Uh, Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy is licensed in many states all over the country, and, you know, my goal is to have book signing events in at least all those states and in other states also. Um, you know, that's that's really what I want to do. I mean, my goal at the pharmacy has always been to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. And that's basically what I've done with the book. Um, if you look at chapter six, there's a six step solution in how to fix health care. And the number one step is to educate and empower consumers to take charge of their own health. That's the only way it's gonna fix the system. 
we can't rely on the government to fix the system. They're the ones that screwed it up. So consumers need to take charge of their own health. I like the quote in that chapter too, because this is, you know, and I, and I want you to remember this. If you can remember one thing from this podcast, I want you to remember this. Um, the quote from the opening chapter at the very top of that is um, the best health insurance we have is not some kind of policy that we can buy. It's how we take care of ourselves, period. That is the best health insurance we have. And I think if people understood that, they would probably take better care of themselves. So, Sean, where, if they don't have to wait for a book signing event, where can people purchase your book? Yeah, they can purchase my book on Amazon. So go to Amazon and type in um, the book's name, Sickened, How the Government Ruined Healthcare and How to Fix It. It'll come up. You can buy it on Kindle version, paperback version, also working on the audio version. Um, I also want to tell you, so you can, and Steph, if you can stream a banner like this, if you can make a quick banner about this. Um, if you want updates on the book, you can text this number, 844-621-2338, and text SICKENED to that number, and you will be opted in to updates on the book, including the audio update. So 844-621-2338. Text the word SICKENED, and you will be um, added to the opt-in for updates on on the book so um that's and and always tune in to our podcast now we do this podcast twice a week every monday 12 30 to 1 30 i'm streaming live right here on my facebook page and the most like professional pharmacy facebook page and we will give you um, more updates on on our on the book we also have a midweek podcast that's one thing that the government shutdown did do is it enabled us to expand our podcast so we do it twice a week now and we have a midweek podcast and you ranging anywhere from tuesday tuesday from wednesday to thursday depending on the time um and depending on our guest schedule so and depending on our, on our travel so you don't want to miss on our podcast we're on all the podcast forums too so make sure you go into google play itunes um like subscribe and um, Rumble, don't forget about our Rumble account. Uh, Rumble has never ever censored us. They're the only, they're the only um, application that has not censored us. Even the podcast forums have censored us before. So um, we we like Rumble because they have never censored us. Janet, do you have any more questions for me? I don't. You don't have any more questions for me. That's yeah. really you're you're being no, really I too easy. I gotta go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to thank all of our listeners and viewers again for tuning in and, you know, keep tuning in here so you can get updates on my book. Um, don't forget, you can always reach out to me on on Facebook. I have people every day reach out to me on Facebook about my book. So go to my personal Facebook page and go to my go to Facebook Messenger um, and I will answer your questions. So thank everybody for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you for tuning in.